Good day, good people. My name is Brad King, and this is the Downtown Riders Jam video podcast, which is part of the Solid Listen Podcast Network. Max and Dog and I are coming to you from deep inside the jam bunker on the weekend before the 4th of July. I'm the only dog on the planet. I'm fairly certain that this is not hyperbole. Who loves fireworks? fireworks go off he wants to go outside and watch them so i am anxious to see what happens this weekend gonna have a little get together some friends girlfriends in town gonna be grilling out i'm gonna have my dog watching fireworks today on the program we have the wonderful hannah tovey her book is this it is out in july you should pre-order it right now so i'm gonna give you the bio and then i'm gonna tell you the dumbass question that I ask and why these kinds of questions get asked. So Hannah's from South Wales, uh, but she grew up in Hong Kong. This is important. What I just said is important to the question that I'm going to get to. She graduated from the Faber Academy in 2018, where she finished her debut novel, The Education of Ivy Edwards. She lives in East London, where she misses uh, Lanolai Beach, which I don't know where that is. Maybe Wales, maybe Hong Kong. These are things that Americans don't know. Uh, misses her mother and cockles her second novel comes out in july that's is this it so if you've listened to the program if you're a long time listener first time caller i interviewed a woman a long time ago named uh stephanie scott she was fantastic she told the greatest anecdote ever about growing up eating breakfast with orangutan in the hong kong zoo so being the asshole that i am I see Hong Kong, I see London, and I go, well, Hannah, do you know Stephanie? Like, that's just the kind of thing you don't ask people, right? Like, what are the odds? Well, the odds are uh, 100%, like, they knew each other. I think maybe Stephanie came through the Faber Academy as well. I can't remember. Um, And that may have been how they met, but I was just like, oh, writers, Hong Kong, like, London. Surely the families must have known each other. I I don't know why that went through my head, but that is also the kind of thing that I do in the real world. Um, drives my girlfriend crazy because I will literally just talk to anybody that walks by and I see things like that. And I'm like, Oh yeah, maybe. And in this case, yeah, it was a thing. So you got that to look forward to before we get to that, before you get to hear this amazing interview and she's fantastic. We had such a good time. Um, there's a tremendous amount of laughing. There's some business we got to get to. If you listen to the show, you know, what's coming. So the jam proper, our 60 minute show comes out every Wednesday. And the video podcast, you know, comes out on Mondays and Fridays ish. Like we record those as we get around to them. And there's two things you can do to help us spread the word about this show. Everybody's getting back there in their cars or going to school, like back to work, working out, hiking, doing all kinds of stuff. They still don't want to talk to people. We want to have, you know, the earbuds in. So you need to tell them about this show so that they can listen. The other thing you need to do is leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you've got an iPhone or an iPad, head on over to Apple Podcasts. You can actually leave us a written review, and that would be fucking fantastic. You can also head over to our Facebook page and leave us a review there, or head to the Writer's Jam and leave us a testimonial through the contact page. While you're there, you can check out this video series. You can also buy the books of anybody who's been on the show by clicking on that bookshop link. Looking for a book to read? We got a review section, or you can just sign up for the newsletter and all kind of goodness comes into your mailbox once a month, your email box. I sound like I'm a thousand years old right now. You can also support the entire Solid Listen Network by clicking on that Patreon button. When you do for just a couple bucks a month, commercial-free episodes of all of our shows and all kinds of special content by uh, everybody on the network. Uh, This was a fun interview. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot. I sort of said some of it at the top of the show because you know what? I'm going to break format when I feel like uh, breaking format. It's my goddamn show. She's fantastic. I always love interviews when I talk to authors and they're just like, you just sort of like sync up and you're just having a good time. It's one of my favorite parts about this show is meeting people from the other side of the world who you just get on with because you sort of do the same thing and you have um, not the same background, but the same things that drive you, the same things that interest you. Oftentimes, many writers that I know and hang out with have a similar weird sense of humor. If you're constantly dissecting the world, you know, fucking everything's kind of funny. Um, 
sometimes in a dark tragic way but like you, they, you sort of you have to do that you have to let that stuff off somewhere otherwise it will eat you up um it's why being a writer is the worst job in the whole world but also the best job if it was in fact a job which most of the time it is not that is neither here nor there so i'm really excited for you guys to hear this today she's lovely um how often do you get to hear about whales not nearly as much as you should so you're going to hear a little bit about that and i appreciate you guys coming and spending just a little bit of time with max and i here in the bunker i hope that your day is going well i hope that you are taking care of yourself and everybody around you as much as you can hope you're giving yourself some space and grace as we all move back into the world and i hope you will sit back for the next 30 minutes or so and enjoy my conversation with hannah toby uh, I was actually looking. Um, do you? This is a weird question since you live in a giant country. Do you know <laughs> Stephanie Scott? Yes, I do know Stephanie Scott. <laughs> I do. So she studied at the Faber Academy, which is where I studied as well. We weren't in the same year. I think she was a couple of years below me, and there were like six classes per year. Um, but I think we, I believe we had the same tutor, Richard Skinner. Yeah. It would, Such a small I, world. I just saw like I just saw Hong Kong and I was looking at your book yeah. and your writing and I'm like, OK, what are the because uh, I've had Stephanie yeah. on the show and she's oh, great. have you? She's yeah. amazing. She's yeah. amazing. She's an incredible writer. Yeah. And her story is also hilarious of like, if, as I'm recalling, like continually let like her father wanted her to do this thing and like she was trying to do this thing and then was like, I think I'm going to be a writer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're born in Wales. Like, how do you, how, how do you guys end up in Hong Kong? Like, how does that happen? So we ended up in Hong Kong. So my dad is an engineer. He does bridges and trains. Um, that's his jam. And he got a job over there when I was eight. And so he moved out first and then we followed from a very small town called, Clanechley in South Wales. Um, even I struggle saying it sometimes. As you <laughs> I saw did. you blink. <laughs> like, oh. um, and yes, we left this tiny, teeny town and moved to Hong Kong, um, which was phenomenal in so many ways, but also traumatizing when you're nine and your friends are your whole entire world. And then you're told to move to this country that you, I mean, I hadn't heard of Hong Kong. Um, I, I just knew that it was a 12 hour flight away and that seemed like, oh my God. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then we stayed there until, well, my dad's actually still there. Um, I haven't seen him for 18 months because obviously not sure. um, allowed to fly. So yeah, he's still out there. And then I moved back here for university when I was 18. But it's weird. I still call it home in an odd way. Um, even though I haven't lived there for like, I'm 35 next week. So that's a long time. And yeah, it still feels like home to me. Yeah, it's weird, right? Like, uh, I grew up in a very small town in Appalachia in in Ohio. Yeah, but Austin is where I'm. Like, so I have that hometown and I love that place. But I moved to Austin as an adult when I was like yeah. 22. Austin's sort of, meant to be amazing. I've heard phenomenal things about it. Yeah, it's pretty great. And you know, I was there for 10 years and like it, it that feels very much like the like my home, even though yeah. I've spent in my entirety of my life only 20% of my time there. So strange, isn't yeah. it? There's just something about like you find some places and you're like, I don't know what it is about this place, but it's yeah. Yeah, Hong Kong is one of those places. I miss the food. I miss the people. I miss the smells. Like it smells really grotty and grimy and really close, but I really miss that. Um, yeah. yeah, the food's exceptional as well. So yeah, well, I mean, thing. you're in London now too, right? Yes. Um, haven't been able to experience much uh, restaurant eating for a long time. Uh, <laughs> ate inside my first restaurant last week, and that was uh, incredible. Um, I actually cried when I got home because I felt normal again and like haven't yeah. felt like that for such a long time um but yeah we do have a fantastic um um restaurant scene here and hopefully it'll pick up because i just feel so sorry for all those teeny tiny restaurants in like the heart of central uh london who can only kind of their capacity is like 20 people anyway so for them to spread out chairs and yeah. socially distance yeah must be a complete and utter nightmare. Yeah, I was when I would spend time over there. Uh, I did work at the Soho Theater. Oh yeah, and which is great. Like I love Soho, and I was 
as I moved into my new house, I've been hanging pictures. So I've been ordering pictures to hang. And I came across this trove of stuff from like Bar Italia, which is this little oh coffee God, shop, yes. right? It's this on great- Dean's, I want to say it's on Dean Street because Soho Theatre is on Dean Street. So maybe yeah. it is, yeah, amazing. And, but that's one of, it's a little tiny place. It's like a little shotgun place. And I was just sort of like, oh, like even if they're open, they could only have like four people in there. Like everybody would be sitting on the street. And, I know, so uh, tough for them. Yeah, and like that part of town is, I mean, I know all of London is sort of that way, but like that is primarily where I'd hang out. And it's like every place there is just this little tiny. It's teeny yeah. tiny, teeny um, tiny. Yeah. Is, thinking about all that. So um, I, I was looking at the book. Is this yeah. it? Um, and this I so conveniently Emily, have a copy here. That's very nice. Emily Given is like one of my favorite writers. Like I love reading oh, yeah. her books. And like I looked at this and started reading it. I'm like, oh, I feel like I get a sense of where this book is going. Like this feels <laughs> like <laughs> just re and like reading the description is obviously very cheeky as well. Like yes. Um, so tell me about the book. Tell me what the book is about. So um is this it is a comedy and it's about <laughs> big dreams and big love and refusing to settle for a um half-lived life so at the start of the novel ivy feels ivy is the, the protagonist she feels like something is missing from her life um she's just turned 30 and like a lot of women her age she expected more and she expected more because as women we're told that by the time we hit 30 we have to have the perfect job the perfect um house the perfect relationship and that's just incredibly toxic in loads of ways anyway i just digress <laughs> she um that's she, not in the book <laughs> that is in the book is it in the book <laughs> yes definitely um so one evening she turns her phone off and she dreams of a better life a better job a just yeah she dreams of more the next morning over a cold plate of pizza she <laughs> she makes this list and this list changes everything um for her and it's about the the uh the desires we have to change our life and how challenging that can be um and it also tackles themes of loneliness and this never ending pressure on women to self improve, which I think has never been more timely. Yeah, that is this it in a nutshell. <laughs> As every good comedy is, is rooted in like the daily horrors of life. <laughs> yes, definitely the daily horrors of life for sure. And I, hopefully that's what makes it relatable. I'm very much as a writer interested in writing about complex uh, women particularly and um, to show them in all their facets because I think that is important and that's what's true to life and I think the the more sort of you show female characters who are flawed and messy and um, I like to call those human <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. But the more you see that, the more you realize that it's okay to be that in you um too, which I think is important. Yeah. It's my uh my friend, I've known Janelle Brown for 20 oh, something yeah. years. Like we were we were reporters and writers back a long time ago. So I've watched her career. And when uh Watch Me Disappear came out, I brought mm -hmm. her out to India Indianapolis to do some events. We had this writing collective there. And I was like, oh, my God, like one of the things I love about her books is like, I'm, I love the I love the characters in your books. And she was like, actually, I'm accused of writing unlikable characters. And I was like, yeah. well, I need to reconsider my entire life because <laughs> to me, I'm like, they're li like, I like them because they are complex and rich. And like anybody that definitely I mean, I'm wearing a black hat, but like anybody that rolls in with a white or black hat, you're like, be more than that. <laughs> You know, like <laughs> because the world is really complicated and hard and like you can be good in one ways and bad in the other. And like, I just I find those characters more interesting. Absolutely. I, th I, th I think that there's a lot. Also, there's a lot of comedy in pain and heartache. And I've always <laughs> found that really yeah. interesting. Um, I'm not drawn to characters who have their shit together a i don't think that's relatable but also it's just it's not exciting or thought provoking it's like yeah that's not that's not exciting to me at all as yeah. a reader 
or a writer. And so I think um, it's really important to put all the shit on the page and throw as much as you can as a car- uh, at a character and just see what happens. I'm yeah. all for that. And also, I, I mean, I've always told people, like, if I see somebody and they're like, oh, my God, their life is perfect. I'm like, they're lying about something. Everyone is lying. Everyone <laughs> yeah. is just faking it and lying to themselves and lying to you. Like, everyone's struggling on the inside and that's in that's just life isn't it yeah well and it's what you know it's i've had this discussion with people who like write um rom-coms and comedies and and things Mm. of that nature um i actually find those to be because i realize like in the literary world those are sometimes sort of put off in this other sort of little corner of a thing um and that you know like i think about the shows that i love watching yeah. Um, uh, like Parks and Rec or like now Ted Lasso or like the ori- the British office, like seeing these things that are like, you actually can- You were mine speaking a- my language. Yeah. 100% like, speaking my language. You, you can really mind the, I mean, I would hope so since you're writing these books about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like there is a certain, um, you know, like you can mind the sort of, again, the treasuries of life, which is what mm. it means to be human in those what kinds of places, yeah. right? Like, yeah. Um, yeah I actually as part of my research and I'm not lying when I say this to you I watch The Office the American one and Parks and Rec I think if I want to be a bit inspired particularly when I'm writing dialogue I go towards US sitcoms because they write about it's that sort of you're writing about often often topics that seem mundane but they are brought to life in such color and comedy and I think there are a ton of US sitcoms who do that incredibly well so yeah if I want to feel inspired I'm like Parks and Rec, The yeah. Office, absolutely. Uh, Michael Schur, like Michael Schur, Michael did, Schur oh right God, like The yeah. Good Place, Parks yeah. and Rec, like Brooklyn Nine-Nine, like Brooklyn, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Nine-Nine more, he did of course he did as well yeah yeah, yeah. that's a little He's more amazing. satirical and a little bit less yeah. grounded in reality but like um, still super funny yeah it's hilarious but like it's The really Good funny. Place in the, at, I haven't at, seen it. Oh my gosh! So it's it turns out this is just a side. It turns out that the book that that show was based on was written by the father of my first editor at Wired. So I like oh fell gosh. in love with this show and I'm writing about it. And all of a sudden, Jesse sends a book. She's like, um, by the way, my dad, who's a philosopher, wrote the book that that show is based on. <laughs> oh my god! When did you write that book? Like a long time ago. Wow, that just yeah. goes to show, right? Yeah, but wow. it's, it's a, it's a, I think if you like those other shows, like I feel like that show will speak to you okay. because it's both funny, but it's in the afterlife. So everybody's dead. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of a treatise on like, what does it mean to be a human? Um, okay. And all of its facets. And it's got a diverse cast. And, you know, like those are the kinds of things like, anyway, like when I see really good, when I see books, when I see these sort of comedies or rom-coms or wherever, I don't really like labels, but wherever this falls into, I'm like, oh, this is going to be that book, right? Like there's going to be some things that are mined around that. And it's not just going to be like, fluffy, everybody is happy. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And I think with rom-com and with chiclet, it gets a really bad rep because people think you can't be a serious writer and do chiclet or rom-com but I completely disagree with that yeah, yeah. and I think they are incredible genres that are really important and provide just a lot of like um joy and uh I think that's really important to readers yeah I uh, I've had that discussion with people on the show so many times like in fact I was talking about it the other day horror and the romance world where mm. people are building their own careers by like pumping stuff out once a month I've told people like Anybody that dismisses that has no idea how I'm not saying that everything is war and peace, but like you sit down and write something that's publishable once a month rip and do it and like build a fan base and get people invested in the world you're building. I'm like, it may not be your cup of tea, but don't tell me that that's not work and skillful. Yeah, I completely (laughs) agree with you, Ben. Yeah. So um, this is like I rarely ask literary questions, but like, what was the question? Like, what was the question that set you down the road to write this book? Like, what was the thing where you were like, oh, that popped into my head and there we are. So I I had the idea of Ivy, although I didn't know that she would become Ivy when I was um, sort of early 20s. Um, I wanted to be an actress. I trained to be an actress, but because I have a stammer, e- even though... I'd never stammered on stage in the the audition process was excruciating and I then began 
writing loads as as a release really which was amazing um in lots of ways and I knew I wanted to write about Welsh characters because I don't you don't really see a lot of Welsh characters on screen or on the page I also knew that I wanted to write about this notion of of identity because I'm from South Wales we moved to Hong Kong I live in London and that notion of who you are and, and where where you think of as home has always really sort of appealed to me. Also, I'm just really drawn to, as I said earlier, just like uh, female characters who um, who are on the edge, on the emotional edge, who are, you know, about to lose their shit. I find that really interesting and uh, <laughs> really exciting as a reader. And so I've always wanted to explore that. Um, in and another guess, interview, we'll figure out why that is. Yeah. <laughs> that could be a long yeah. interview, okay? That could be a long interview. Uh, but yeah, I think, and, and then before, um, I joined Faber Academy and um, I did their six-month writing course. And it was incredible because every week, 15 people critique your work. And sort of, I honed the, the story then, but I didn't... I always knew kind of vaguely what I wanted to write about, but it wasn't until um, I would say just before I was 30 that I kind of like the story crystallized. And I think that's why it's important that that she had just turned, that the character had sure. just turned 30, because I, I think that throws up a ton of questions as a woman. And I think it's a really interesting topic to explore. Yeah, I mean, and we, we talked a little bit about this uh, before. There are benchmarks. I always tell people, like, there are just benchmarks in everybody's life. Um, like, 25 is sort of one. Like, 30 is absolutely one. Like, I yeah. always tell people, 30 is, like, when you suddenly have more friends that are further out of university than, like, you're hanging out with a different crowd. <laughs> the expectation is different, right? Like, it's no longer, let's go out yeah. Tuesday night. It's like, it's Tuesday night. I am not going That's out. Like, what? Good, yes. Right, yes. and, like, there's just that demarcation of 30 i think is the first big like mm -hmm. oh shit oh shit like mm -hmm. i because i i remember when i turned 30 i was working as an editorial assistant mm -hmm. i think i was 28 or 29 actually yeah. and i went to my bosses and i was like i'm not going to be a 30 year old editorial assistant and i ended up getting a different job as an editor and writer at a different place and it was literally because i'm like it, it, that that job is okay in your 20s but if you're that doing that in your 30s like for whatever reason i was like there's just yeah, that trajectory yeah. is not right. Like you've Absolutely. you've done something wrong. So I do feel like that is a fulcrum point that, you know, obviously for gender and race and like all of those things are sort of they're different for everybody. But I feel like 30 is the thing we all like, yep. <laughs> yeah, and it shouldn't be because it's one of the things like exploring the book, like life is, you know, constantly changing. You you can do anything at 30, 40, 50, 60, whatever, but the society tells us that you have to be at a certain stage at your life at a certain age and I think it's so toxic and there's a price that we as women pay for that the pressure yeah. that we put on ourselves and the cost of that I think is really um severe um and I think a lot of people don't talk about it but yeah I mean when you're 30 you're expected to be married and with children and have this perfect job i just yeah it's just it's uh it's toxic yeah, yeah that's well, why it's toxic i think that it is um this is one of those like topics that we could you know over a beer talk about forever but it for me it is one of those like it's hard to separate society i mean obviously there are systemic things that push people and and, and control us in ways that we don't see there's mm -hmm. also like local friend group there's also like parent religious they're like i think all of those things look different depending on where you're coming from and like what the expectation is Definitely. and so this is very clearly an expectation of like you know this sort of traditional western like oh this is what you are supposed to be doing yes. right like yeah, this is sure. where you're at um, and I do, I find like you've traveled around the world. So I know you've seen, you see both the 30 thing, but also the ways different cultures and even micro cultures navigate that. Is, Absolutely. It's, yeah. yeah, it's super interesting. It is and all, but only once you're through it, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And definitely 49. not when you're in the thick of it. No. And if I was talking about this on a podcast the other day. Like, I wish because I've been in therapy for the last four or five years because, mm -hmm. you know, as a as a man, like there's I, I mean, what I have started telling people is like men have to realize that we are weapons and it is like we are loaded weapons all the time. And so it's incumbent upon us to like do it like trauma therapy and emotion, like be okay, like develop your empathy so that that is not exploding out onto the world, yeah. particularly white men, right? Where we, there's not really rails that sort of keep in the way that it yeah. keeps, like there are rails for almost everybody else except yeah. for us, right? And so, you know, I was like, well, I wish I could go back to 15 year old Brad and be like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to start a little therapy now. <laughs> you know? Like save you the 30 years of being an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what would a 15 year old Brad have said to that person? Well, I think if I showed up, I wouldn't have given him a choice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think all 15 year old boys should be given a choice. I'm like, here's what we're going to do because you don't know anything. Yeah, true. Yeah. Um, so we're, the last thing we're going to talk about, because again, well, we talked about this uh, off uh, is is act. So you're fr so when you said like there's not representation of like people from Wales, um, I have like I'm from Appalachia, so I like we you actually are saying a lot of things and I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I feel that deeply because yeah. the, the, the whales representations that I've seen on television are always like weird character, funny comedy, right? Playing up the language and the accent and the sort of yeah. like working class dumbness of I yes. put that in quotes, right? Like, yes, that's that is what the world knows as the Welsh way. Absolutely. And also you don't I'm. I don't speak the language, I don't speak Welsh, but I put a lot of Welsh language into the book. And I think it's important to see other languages on the page. And often in the UK, all we see is English and characters that are from London predominantly. We don't see yeah. a lot of characters that are outside of the big city. And I think that's changing. I think it's really important that it is changing. But yeah, I think the characters who you've seen traditionally who are Welsh are that stereotypical, um, dumbed down version, yeah. I think. Um, yeah. And I don't think that's fair. I think there's comedy in that to an extent, but I think it's important to see, see authentic Welsh characters. Um, I think we are very funny, passionate people, and um, Wales is just rich in culture, and the language is amazing. And I always feel really sad that kind of I left so young and hadn't had the opportunity yeah. to learn it because um, it is a beautiful language. Uh, it's also freaking hard to learn, yeah. but it's, it's beautiful. Which is it's amazing. like it's like it's like uh, Hungary. Like it's yeah, it's, it yeah. does sound like yeah. it does. Yeah, it's exactly, like a language exactly. that exists yeah. unto itself, yeah. and you're like, you're well, like, knowing what? any other language doesn't help you yeah. at all. Yes, yeah. I had a had a Welsh teacher. I lived in Wales after uni for a few months, like five or six months. Had a Welsh tutor in that time, and she was like, "Look, if if you're ever stuck, just add an O at the end of the verb, and it becomes Welsh." I was like, what? She's like, you know, like, um, there's, there's a world called- that sounds like a terrible teacher. <laughs> she was a terrible teacher, but she's kind of right. Like, um, yeah, I don't know when it becomes Welsh. Yeah, bizarre. That's hilarious. It's, it, is, it is one of those things that, you know, when, until I started spending a lot of time in Europe and like a lot mm -hmm. of time, and would spend time in London and, and Birmingham and, and, you know, just sort of like bouncing around mm. with my friends. I didn't know anything about Wales, right? Like mm. in America, that's just not like, I knew it as like, I think there's a character in Spaced who is like a DJ biker guy who's like, there's, there, oh. there, there's like, occasionally there would be Welsh characters that would pop up in these, and they were always yeah. played for comedy. Yeah. And then yeah. I got there and I was like, oh my God, there's this whole, like, there's a thing. It's very much like Appalachia and here in a country where it's like, uh, we're sort of the butt of the joke, but like, yeah. nobody's really like, 
we've sort of been left behind and you're sort of yeah. not really paying attention to us and well, like economics is yeah and i was like oh i feel like i need to spend some time in wales because i feel like you guys are my people <laughs> like there <laughs> come back to wales when you're allowed absolutely absolutely i think the it. eu said i think uh, europe said that if you're vaccinated like we'll be able to come over in the summer or fall so come on over i'm making plans uh <laughs> hannah it was lovely to talk to you um the book is so this, it is too. out it's out in july right it's out the 22nd of July. You can pre-order now if you want to treat yourself. And I'd be delighted <laughs> if you could treat yourself. Is it uh, out in America and England? Or is it just, do we go to Waterstones to get it? You go to Waterstones. You can try, um, go to your local independent bookshop. Um, if you're in the States, you'll be able to get it on ebook. And then you'll be able to get it on Amazon as well awesome. from July. Yeah. But oh. obviously, don't go to Amazon. I should say that. Yeah. Don't go to Amazon. I always Don't tell people like, if you can go to bookshop, which is bookshop.org, yeah. which is the local bookstore affiliates around here. Yes, but I, because I don't have a US publishing deal. I don't, it was really weird. Last yeah. year when my um, debut novel came out, you could get it on Amazon US, but you couldn't get it at other bookshops in US because I didn't have a publishing deal out there. So it's like, how, how did it get on Amazon? Anyway, yeah. Try to buy it elsewhere. Yeah, that's great. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to reading it. It is so lovely to talk to you. Um, so good to talk to you too. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I hope we can do this again soon. Awesome. Well, there you have it. That was Hannah Toby. Her book, Is This It?, is out in July. Before we get out of here, just a couple of reminders. If you like what you heard, do us those two favors we talked about at the top of the show. Tell your friends about us, leave us a review. And if you've got that Apple phone, or iPod. Well, there you have it. That was Hannah Toby. Her book, Is This It?, is out in July. Before we get out of here, just a couple reminders. If you like what you heard, do us those two favors we talked about at the top of the show. Tell your friends about us and leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you've got an iPad or the iPhone, head on over to Apple Podcasts and you can leave us a little written review, super helpful. While you're at it, don't forget to check out the other programs on the Solid Listen Podcast Network, including the flagship Mother May I Sleep With Podcast with host and our Solid Listen Podcast queen, Molly MacLear. Don't forget, we've got these video podcasts coming out Monday, Friday-ish on the Solid Listen Network YouTube channel. You can also catch the audio on the Downtown Writers Jam podcast channel and the jam is out every Wednesday. So get yourself subscribed wherever you listen to podcasts and don't miss an episode. And remember, you can always catch us on Twitter and Instagram. Until the next time, I will see you around the internet and happy 4th of July. <laughs>